I am so totally pumped and honored to get to share with Heather this introduction of our keynote speaker, Sun Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. When we started planning this conference, uh, we made a list of possible keynotes, and no joke, Sun Michelle was at the top. I'm not saying that just because he's here. <laughs> it's the truth. We could show you the list. <laughs> we mostly learned about Sun through his avid social media posts on TikTok and Instagram, as well as his merch. Uh, he's probably wearing something really cool right now, so definitely check that out. Uh, asking Sun to start off our conference today was our go big or go home approach, and it worked. Uh, we were all surprised he responded so quickly um, and impressed by his commitment to not only linguistic justice, but the anti-racist and anti-misogynistic practices necessary to fighting language equity. Son was born the middle child of a Pentecostal holiness minister father and missionary, that's his mother, in Charleston, South Carolina, a true Gullah Geechee Binya native. He was reared in rural Mount Holly, South Carolina and familial village established in the late 1850s. The rich Gullah language and culture he absorbed growing up on those sandy, low country back roads is ever present in his life as an artist, advocate, and educator. If he doesn't, if he doesn't sound dope enough for you yet, Sun is also a musician who has released albums and performed in the United States and overseas. As an educator and advocate, Sun Michelle has cultivated a strong following online via social media with frequent viral content ranging from pop culture commentary, allegor and allegorical anecdotes and entertainment to serious discussion advocacy, philanthropy via crowdfunding. He uses this content to promote intellect, ethics, enlightenment, and education, the latter of which led him to 2017, in 2017, to becoming the first and only Gullah language instructor at Harvard University. In this role, he teaches a curriculum based on extensive research and his own personal Gullah Geechee knowledge and experience. And in all of his free time, in case you can't tell, Sun also dedicates energy to Project Teach at Harvard, um, a program that supports students' aspirations for college and professional careers when they're in middle school. As a resident lecturer for Project Teach, Sun returns to middle school classrooms a space where he felt different because of how he found it as a Gullah speaking kid. Some success, which he attributes to the collective excellence of his culture and people overall. Uh, and his work with Project Teach allows middle school kids of color to see themselves represented. Sun's lived experiences and his active resistance to linguistic discrimination and bias have shaped his work at Harvard and beyond and his music, like Michelle noted. Um, if after his keynote, you're excited to learn more about Sun like we all were, uh, check him out on social media. And as a quick shout out, he will have a mixed media memoir that showcases who he is through his talents in storytelling, songwriting, spoken word, photography, and education. So uh, please join us in welcoming Sun Michelle. Emoji class and reactions will work great. Today. Awesome, awesome. Is everyone able to hear me? We good? Awesome. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the uh, introduction. I am uh, very pleased to be here, to say the very least. Um, I was excited. And just the name uh, in regards of, of the acronym LEARN um, got me really excited because I am all about language equity and to, I think I said this in our meeting that it was kind of like the <laughs> kind of like the Avengers with everyone coming from their own background to um, for this effort and and being that you were in in different institutions and um, still had that in common was really amazing. Um, I want to get right to it. Um, in speaking of of, of the Learn acronym, um, up until the very last minute, when I'm still uh, preparing and promoting that you know I'm going to be here. Uh, there are people who, uh, you know, a couple of people who who said um, brought up that the learn um, acronym doesn't make sense because the N in knowledge is not the beginning of the of the the, the word the knowledge. They're saying oh it it actually should be you know the the K not the N. 
And I said, you know, well, why do you say that? And they said, well, you know, the word knowledge starts with a K. It just makes sense. And I asked, like, you know, well, how does it make sense that a word that starts with the N sound begins with a K? They're like, but that's, that's just how it's spelled. Says who? Well, well that's, that's just the spelling. That, that, that's just how it's spelled. Even though it, it starts with a K, like, that's, that's, that's just the way it is. And they didn't have an answer for why it made sense. The answer was just, that's just the way it is. I, I, that's what I was told. And the person who was told me that was told that and back, 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 back. And we'll say, well, it, it, when the silent letters in words, I always say, blame the French. Um, but in silent letters in words, we'll say, well, it's because of the, you know, the etymology that it started in this language and that language. And that, that's all well and good. But in most cases, those words have evolved over time as well. That's, they, they don't sound the way that they did um, originally. Um, they don't, they're not spelled the way that they did originally. They evolved over time. There's the denotation and the connotation of the word that allowed it to be able to evolve over time. But at some point in certain societies, it becomes this mindset that that's enough. That's enough evolution. That's enough changing. No, 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 no more. We don't, you know, regardless, regardless of where the, the etymology of regardless, we don't need irregardless. Irregardless is, is incorrect whether or not the word started out as regardless in the first place. If you've added on to the word, the root word, that, that's enough. Conversate is, is too much. We don't need conversate. Even though backforming creates Absolutely. other words. And so there's, there's uh, evacuate, escalate, all these other words that we've, we've, we've created to mean exactly what we know they mean. I mean, we, we know the meaning. We know the person's communicating, but we still feel the need to quibble about the prefix or the suffix that's been attached to it for whatever the reason may be. And, and, and that reason doesn't have to be academic. And that is the conventional wisdom. Why would I not use the N and knowledge if the entire point of learn is to reimagine what it is we're calling knowledge. There's, there's a, an idea that knowing a thing, in, in and of itself, that knowing a thing is the value. We're not, we're not weighing the worth of the thing that you know, just the thing itself, knowing a thing is, is the value. And there is value in knowing stuff, but the nature of that knowledge also matters because there's a lot of people who are passing down uh, information and ideas, many of which were you know, spoken about at the beginning, at the intro of, of this conference. Ideas that are anti this group, ideas that are bigoted against that group. That's, that's knowledge, you know it. But what good is it doing anyone if that knowledge that you have in your head isn't pushing progress forward, isn't pushing for a greater good. What, what difference does it make if someone says conversate or converse when even converse as a word didn't always mean what it means? It, it didn't always mean to have conversation. It, it, even in mathematics, there's a different different uh, variation of converse. So we're picking and choosing what these words mean as we see fit, but still we find a way to categorize people in sections depending on how they make use of sounds. And that's essentially what words are, sounds that we've assigned meaning to. If I make the sound Oi, just O-Y, that may have no meaning whatsoever until someone says, Oi, now it has meaning. Now maybe I'm frustrated. Oi, maybe I'm hailing someone. It only has meaning based on the context of use, but we throw away the context of use 
and insist on the denotation when it's convenient. What that thing denotes, what it means, what the dictionary says. Well, the dictionary is a misnomer. There's no one dictionary. There's no, no singular dictionary. And even of the dictionaries, uh, there are different variations, different types, different forms of definitions, but dictionaries are descriptive, not prescriptive. The, the purpose of dictionaries is not so that you can know how words are supposed to be used. The purpose of dictionaries is for you to know how words have been used. It's a, it's a snapshot of how we're using these words. Now, you have the option from there to use it that way. You, you have the option to say, now that I know that this is the way that this word has been used for X amount of time or dating back to 1500 or, or whatever the time is by X amount of people in this cult, you, you now have the option to say, I will now, now use it that way. That's what it means to these people. But you also have the option to say, mm, no, I want it to mean something else to me. And that's what happens in Gullah culture very often. I am from a literal dirt road. Um, people say they're from the country. Um, I am quite literally from uh, the country. My family has been living on our family land, um, you know, that village since uh, the 1850s. So you can tell how circumstances have changed for us on that land um, from then to now. And I don't consider it land ownership. It's really more land stewardship. Um, it's never your land. It's just your turn. And you hope to not fumble it and pass it on to the next generation and so forth. And so it's my turn. And a part of it being my turn is to represent the culture. Um, and I do that in all that I do. Now, some of the things um, that were said in regards of my professional bio um, is that I have been at Harvard for um, seven years now, almost eight years. And it's been a wild ride, but I will, I will never forget the very, very beginning. When the value of being there for me was always the community. It was always not the prestige and not the validation of our worth because we know what we're worth. But in the halls of academia, for these institutions that mean so much to the people who will be the first wave of influencers in our lives outside of our homes, our educators, to grow up speaking a language that in a classroom, if I had talked like this in the classroom, they'll correct me, even if I say in the, the sentence correct, this would be incorrect. Even though the sentence is the same, I say none different, but this would be incorrect. You know, if I put an H at the beginning of apple, if, if I take the drop the D off the end of Ben, or bent, or B-E-E-N, and they all sound the same. He ban them up, he ban they, he bun they. All of those things, if you're a teacher in my hometown, it's the onus is on you to know how we speak. That, that's literally your job to understand the people that you're teaching. So if I'm saying, ben, 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 ben. now maybe you don't know what I mean, but what I'm saying is that Benjamin has been there for a while. But the repeat repetition of Ben three times in the same sentence being corrected because it's redundant and can be confusing. But yet if I use the term there in a sentence in regards of um, there, there over there, you know that I mean there, they are over there, or that's theirs over there. You 
you know what it means. You understand the concept. You've been given context to know what it means. And I grew up being what I consider gaslighted by many of the people whose job it was to show me how to merge what I already knew with what I could know. And so when I would ask in regards to the spelling system, how O-U-G-H can make so many different sounds in English. And if that's allowed, then why can't I spell this way in Gullah? Why would it be confusing this way? And the answers were never rational. They always went back to academic standard. And you'll hear people who even now will say, well, I don't, back then, you, you, you pretty much figure out pretty quickly, you better learn how to talk the right way or talk right, i.e. talk white, in a hurry, or the way that you speak will be associated with ignorance, illiteracy, uh, you know, sometimes even, even worse. They would assume that you were guilty of uh, immoral acts. Um, guilty of you know things if 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 someone did something in a classroom something was missing and this person's denying it I have no idea what happened to it and the other person's denying it I ain't know anybody I ain't much been there yeah you sound guilty and so it's this far-reaching thing where we're investing more into the idea of academic correctness than what can be justified. Says who? Who? Why? Why would I not challenge that? The idea of correctness is a social contract. It is correct because we say so. And we stop saying so, then it ceases to be correct. We can think of a lot of different social mores, a lot of different ideas that we no longer believe. We don't. Well, some politicians would have children working in factories again if they could but there are certain things we don't do you don't have certain you know laws have been passed to protect people from uh, popular ideas of what is appropriate well we don't do that anymore everything's been progressing technology and all that's been progressing people have understood at this point in time there's no need to teach children how to write in cursive they, they've just accepted it. We don't, why would we do that? We don't need to write, teach children how to write in cursive. And they just moved on. Let it go, it's a casualty of te modern technology. We don't need to do that. And then there, well, as it turns out, being a strong speller doesn't really matter as much as it used to because spell check. So we, we, we don't need to focus as much on that anymore. Some people at least um, don't. Not that being a strong speller was ever a, a, a measure of a person's um, width and breadth of their intelligence. But there are ideas that we are willing to accept because we progress. Society is, has evolved. Ideas have evolved. But that concept of correctness, the idea, and it's predicated on the idea that language is benign, language is not dangerous that language is one of the good ones. You can corrupt history. You can corrupt sociology. But language is incorruptible. It's just basic grammar. It's just showing you subject, verb, agreement. It's, there's nothing there. There's no agenda there. That's the idea. And because that idea is there, no one questions the thing that comes after. Because I believe that language is simply pure, there's, there's nothing about proper language that has any agenda, then I won't question why the opposite of proper is suddenly an agenda. Well, well, how did it go from, it be, nothing from nothing leaves nothing. 
the opposite of nothing is something, but that still doesn't necessarily define that something in juxtaposition to nothing. But you have you have to have a, a thing to compare it to. So if there's no agenda with language, and I say, oh, okay, well, if there's no agenda and it's harmless and there's there's no big deal, then I'll just do this other thing instead. No, 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 you can't do that. But I thought you said that there was no agenda. I, I thought the correctness was a social contract that we could agree or disagree on. Why, why now, as the meme says, you're a 10, but dot, dot, dot. Why now is that asterisk like taking away from my value? You're, we're all in this together, okay? We're all in this language equity together. We're all representing the cause of pushing the agenda forward for people to be more accepting of one another, right? That's what we're doing. But who are you when you're not at your station? When you're on a dating app, and someone misspells a word in their bio, do you just swipe because that person can't spell? If you're in a conversation with a friend who's telling you something meaningful and they misuse a word, do you need to take a pause from what this person's confiding you about to correct them? Or are you the type who doesn't correct them to their face? You just make sure you use the same word a minute or so later you recast it back to them so they can hear how it sounds said correctly. You just couldn't let it go. Who are you when you're not sitting at your desk, when you're not sitting across from a student, when you're not in your, your position of authority? Who are you when you're at the house, in the car, at the pizza parlor, on a date, softball game, in those conversations, texting with a friend. Is it, is it bothering you that people aren't using punctuation like they used to in text messages? They, they ask you a question and don't put a question mark there, but you can tell that it's a question, but you, you, can't, you can't take that there's a question mark missing or a period missing or punctuation missing. People aren't capitalizing like they used to and it's just driving you nuts. Why? Why? If the first and foremost responsibility of communication is to take this idea and move it from here to here. Here I am, here you are. I need this idea to transfer from here to here. Now I can do that with symbols. I can do that with signing, with my hands. I can do that with words. Do that with letters, which are in their own way, a type of symbol. There's lots of ways of communicating ideas. We have emojis now. I was doing a project teach and a middle schooler asked me a very interesting question. They asked me, are emojis language? Are, is, that a, is that a language? Yes. Yes, emojis are language. And people who would say, well, you can't use an emoji in a formal, I don't care. Formal is not the standard of what, of communication. That's not the, that's a very sort of, it's, it's almost in a sense like legalese or something like where that's a very esoteric sort of thing that you create your own standard. And rule number one is, number one is the rule and cannot be changed. And rule number two is remember rule number one. And if you get confused about rule number two, remember rule number one. It is the rule because it is the rule. It is, this is how you write an academic paper. Says who? But when you get good and ready, you'll have someone like Mark Twain not write that way. Capturing a part of Americana in a manner of speak that is romanticized. That is okay. But if I write that way, or, uh, you know, some of the characters, colorful characters in Mark Twain's books, 
speak that way because he's speaking for them, then it, that voice is accepted because the person who's mimicking our voice is a respected white guy. But let it be, their eyes were watching God. And suddenly the, the people speaking for themselves, it's controversial. And in fact, even other black people might be embarrassed to be heard speaking that way in public. Well, as a kid, I was told that I needed to read Mark Twain in school. I refused. Ain't no way. Language, literature exists in the world. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. I, everything I'm saying right now is not colleagues. It's not for linguists. It's not for academics who can cite this. And they, It's not for you. It's with you. We can talk with you. But ultimately, I want everyday people, which we are, but those who are not in that spin cycle of academia, where we have a way of just the same information over and over and over and over and over again, and you are judged by how well you preserve that cycle. But I want my, you know, a barber, I want a, the butcher, I want my dad. I want my old school uncle to be able to sit in this conference right now and walk away enlightened, informed, know what I'm talking about. So when a kid tells you, I don't like this book. I don't feel comfortable with this book. There's no way I'm going to read this book in this class and have all these white kids giggle every time we say the character Jim's name. It ain't going to happen. And the defense is, well, it's an American classic. You can't tell me this is the only American classic that you can pick. Y'all just decided this was the one. This, this is the one that you've decided is the pinnacle of, of the, the, the standard must mandatory read that kids have to read. This is the one. No, it's not. So I didn't read it. And they said, well, can you think of something else? Yeah, sure. James Baldwin. Are you telling me that James Baldwin was not writing classic material? And to his credit, my teacher let me read James Baldwin instead of Mark Twain. And I know that every educator can't say the same thing like, oh, okay, well, we'll let everybody just do their own thing. It'll be chaos. Is it? I know that when we have class sizes of 30 kids and everybody has their own needs, you can't, you, you have to stick to the lesson plan to keep it moving because they want to make sure that you can apply the same methodology to different groups of kids. And if, if you do it the same way, then we can then measure if it's working or not based on how the kids respond to it. You just have to have a, a line. Well, I was one of those kids. I was a kid who was writing before I could literally write down, creating songs. By four years, three, four years old, I was already humming original melodies. I was already creating my own mythology from being a fan of reading old African and Greek and Roman mythology. To this day, I remember some of the, the gods and demigods that I made up in the storylines for each of them at that time. I had no formal training in instruments, but if you put me in a room with an instrument, leave the room and come back in a few minutes, I'll be playing something on it. And I did that with 20 some odd instruments by the time I was 17 years old. I was a person who had a very keen ear. If you had an accent, even if I didn't try to learn it, if I talked to you about a good five, 10 minutes, I would walk away with your accent. 
a lot of the things that I adapted early on stayed with me, but I could not get it together in class. How do you have a child who's testing on their, their dear IQ test that they value so much? And I score so high that you think that either I cheated or there's something wrong with the test. So you test me again. And I score even higher the next time around. So now that test is no longer valid. This, we're not going to use that. Let's test them again this way or that way. And finally, I fail. I, I'm failing in school, but testing high. I'm writing songs in math class, doing artwork in science class. By the end of the class, the assignment isn't done, but I'm winning competitions with the writing and the artwork. I'm a student teacher for the subject that I'm not doing well in because I've won the writer's conference competition. And that was one of the things that you got to do. And at no point did very many, save for a couple, and I will make sure that I show them love, of those educators stop and say, huh? On my graduating day, one of the, at that time, they were the vice um, principal, and I don't mind putting people on blast, what are they going to do, um, who was before a guidance counselor told me to pull up my pants. That, they saw me down the hallway and told me to pull up my pants. And of course I pull up my pants. They were like crazy sagging, but sagging a little bit. And then they recognized me and said, oh, hey, didn't you win like the, the wrestling tournament? I was like, yes, I did. But you also won the writing competition. Yes, I did. Are you going to college? I. I didn't know how to sign up or I didn't know what to do to go. I went to the guidance counselor, but nobody really told me what to do. I know where I want to go, but I didn't have a plan. You let a student on your watch who had gained notoriety enough to be on your radar win academic awards, athletic awards, and the most you ever said to him was pull up your pants. And the final shot was, I wish I knew you were smarter sooner. I will always remember those words. I wish I knew you were smarter sooner. Was it the Gigi that, got, that threw you off? My, my sagging pants that threw you off? The baby locks, the, the, what, what, what was it that threw you off the trail? This right here was made to believe in those academics always, in those rooms, was made to be a burden. It was the thing that I was told to get rid of the whole time. Only even, even in Charleston, you sound geechy. Why a boy be talking like that? Told to get rid of it. Well, I didn't. The way I collected information when I was a kid, I didn't know if it was going to be worth anything. I just knew that there must be you know, a reason that I'm curious about this planetary alignment. I'm, I'm curious about this rock, these worms, this bug, this, the history of this accent, the way that these people in this island, remote island, how they live, information just absorbing it all, taking it all in. And it was all called worthless because you were so focused on my behavior that you would say things like, why would God, because I'm from the Bible Belt, waste so much talent on such a bad kid? Waste talent on a bad kid. 
I don't know how to speak. Well, I did learn how to speak. I can speak English quite well. In fact, by the time I made it so, maybe through elementary school, thanks to watching Masterpiece Theater, I could not only speak American English, I could speak a spot on British accent from different regions of the UK. I was fascinated by language and language in general, just all the things, but I never let go of my own language as I was told to in academia. And now fast forward to today, some of the people who back then couldn't see value in what I was doing, I knew it, I always knew. You know, good on you. I, oh my God. And so my lesson from that wasn't that they were wrong all along because I'm not going to extrapolate a, a lesson from someone else's folly. My lesson from that was that I stayed true because in this language, it's not just about me. I am keeping culture and people alive. One of the best comments that I always get when people respond to my content is, you remind me of my granddad. Oh, I close my eyes and I can hear my grandmother. This, this reminds me, of my, my brother used to be like that before he died. Oh, this makes me homesick. I want to move back home. Because, and in many instances, I am drawing from real people. People say, oh, but that doesn't sound like my accent and I'm from the same region because I'm drawing from various people, various sources. So you, you'll probably hear Gullah accent, but it's probably going to be like 10 or 10, 12 different variations of Gullah accents because our accents don't all sound the same. But that's because I'm drawing from real live people. And I got a chance to share that with many of these people, some of whom are no longer here. I got a chance to, to, to mock them to their faces lovingly, you know, to their faces. And I got a chance to turn that thing, convert that thing into something that is not only worth preserving, but it's there now. It's in the public eye now. It's in the canons now. It's, it's, it's a part of history now, in the halls of Harvard now. These, those people, as long as they are remembered, they will never die in a space where we were told our language was dead already. And I ask you to reflect, not just on my story, but yours. Think, just think back for a second, like really, okay? Just for a second, go back, college, High school, middle school, elementary school, before we got here, grown ups, knowing all the things that we know, what did you need? What did you have to say? What was the thing? Did when you were finding your voice, was the objective to help you? develop the voice that you had or to give you the voice that was believed to be the voice that you need? Where's your little accent? What happened to that? Was it in the house that you lost your accent because perhaps your parents, be they immigrants or not, thought that their accent would be a burden to you? in a society that looked down on it. Is that what happened? Did you, did you start tightening up those G's at the end and talking and making sure those THs are there, enunciating? Why did you do that? What about, you from Appalachia, from down south, what happened to your twang? Where's that? 
oh, when I get around people that I'm from, you know, you can always tell them, you know, why did you need to do that though? Why, why only when you're around people who are from where you're from? Can you, can you do that? Can you, can you in a, in a meeting use your accent from your, your, your ethnic background? Or is it that at this point in time, you've, you've not done it for so long, when you do it, do you feel inauthentic? Like, think about that. Linguicism and language discrimination can get so deep into your psyche that when you do switch back to your first voice, it doesn't feel authentic. You feel insecure and uncertain about your own voice because you were told that it was not good enough. You were made to believe that non-standard is substandard, and that is not true. I'm gonna tell you something that might come to you as a surprise. Most of the direct negative messaging that I got about Gullah Geechee speech, came from Gullah Geechee people. We, we were used as a blunt instrument to beat each other down into a mush of shame. To the point now where there are people who if I just talk like this on a regular basis, and don't, don't switch out, would be embarrassed. Or they say, man, I from it, and I ain't sound like that. He putting on. That actually ain't sound fake, like he putting on. No, what's happened is you've learned to view our accent as a monolith that's only one way and that thing, that one way is performative. We switch it off and on like a parlor trick for other people's amusement. But do you know that part of the reason that I don't talk like this most of the time is because people make a game out of figuring out what I say. Oh, I could figure out, I understood half of that. I understood X amount percentage of that. I ask you how much you understand. Can you, I want you to imagine your ex ethnicity and speak Y language. And anytime you utilize the accent of that language in speaking English or speaking that language, that most of the responses that you get is you're suddenly a game. Figuring out what you're saying is suddenly a game. Never mind what the, what the thing is about, what you're talking about. I could be talking about something serious, something joking, whatever, but the, the, here comes the comments. Oh, I got 75% of that. Why do I understand that? Am I Gullah? Not understanding that a Creole language, which is Gullah, especially a, an English-based Creole language, part of the reason that Creoles were created in the first place is so that people who don't speak the same language could communicate in the form of a pigeon. If that pigeon survives from generation to the next generation and begins to have its own rules, it becomes a own rule governed language, as I'm sure most, you know, all of you know, um, then it's considered a Creole. And then as it goes on, that becomes their mother tongue. English in its own way is a Creole, but that term is usually reserved for people who have been colonized and forced to speak a dominant language that is not their own original language. And so it, in, in that instant, you'll, you'll, you're the, the mule, the mixture. All those terms come to you, even though the people whose languages that you're being forced to speak by way of linguistic imperialism, their languages are also mongrels. They're mutts, they're mixed. But that's what they want you to believe, that you are the, 
the the mule. And when you say something, you sound different. You don't sound like us. So what do you, where are you from? When it's people from different parts of the diaspora, the Caribbean, Africa, even Hawaii, South America, when it feels different when they say, oh, we sound alike. Oh, I did not know Gullah Geechee people in Bayesian sound so similar. I did not know the Gullah Geechee people in Bahamian Creoles, you know, sounds so, so. that's a different thing. That, that, that feels a little bit different. Although we've been kind of conditioned to see everybody in proximity to ourselves. So they'll say, oh, well, y'all sound like us as opposed to we sound like one another, but still it's, it's a little bit different but you're othering the person and reminding me each time I open my mouth and this come out, you'll remind me you're not one of us. And so that's not what everybody wants to sign up for on a day-to-day -day basis. You, you do it, I still do it. Cause I like to fight. I don't, I don't mind fighting. So I still do it, but I understand the greater good is instead of me just going on my own against the thing and it's a personal journey, somebody has to speak up and, and like, no, because there's a butterfly effect to those implicit biases. And that implicit bias that made you say the person who was cute until they opened their mouth, not that they said anything immoral, not that they said anything unethical, not that they said anything that was offensive. You just didn't like their hillbilly accent. You just didn't like their, their, their country accent. You didn't like their ghetto accent. Now, now, but you're an advocate. We, if, you're, if you're advocating for people on any level and you feel like it's okay, in the context of language to perpetuate the lie, the language is just this benign thing that we should all just learn as a standard. And there's nothing wrong with learning how to speak proper. First of all, it's properly. And secondly, as opposed to what? Why is the idea of broken English so common among people who speak realized languages? When in fact, there is no such thing as broken English. Only broken rules intended to break unbroken people. It is the rule for the sake of itself. And so in unpacking your internal biases, that's your first step before you do anything else. Because before you can have language justice, there's just us. That's it. There's just us. You know what you talk about when nobody's around. You know how you feel. You know what you really think. And if you've ever been around somebody that you never told that you don't like them, but they don't like you. They, they seem like they don't like you and you don't know why they don't like you because you never told them that you don't like you. Could it be possibly because your implicit bias, the thing that is in you is somehow seeping out and manifesting itself in ways that you're not aware of? So yes, if, if we're at dinner and I order the scrimp and you say, oh yeah, the shrimp is great. You didn't need to repeat shrimp after me. Stop recasting people's words to, to correct them softly. You don't need to do that. You heard, you heard what they said the first time. You're not getting a check for that. And if you are getting a check for it, what are you doing for these students in the long run once you've had your turn? You get your turn at bat with these students. And I can tell you now, because you know, you know as well as I, you remember the best and worst teachers you've had. Maybe not by name, but I remember them. I remember being the so-called at-risk teen, the one that I described, the one that checked out in classes, the one that a teacher took special notice to. 
she picked up my notebook and instead of tossing it, she read it. Now, that wasn't even the class that I was supposed to be writing in. She thought it was brilliant. And she encouraged me to continue to write. She would even give me a section of the class so that she could read what I've written. And ultimately, she is the one that signed me up for the writer's competition. And then she was killed in a car accident. And I felt like, well, then there it is. That's, that's my hope gone. And that's what you get for believing me in me, I suppose. I'm just jinxed. But she had a friend who worked at the same school. And she had been telling her friend about the kid who was brilliant. He's a handful, but he's brilliant. And she took me under her wing. And she continued to help me develop as a writer. And one of the things that I remember the most is when I would sometimes turn in writings that were a little bit much, she would give me that look, but then let me keep reading and let me keep writing. And I learned how to pump my brakes a little bit and keep writing. It taught me how to communicate on a personal level and that turned into a public. I remember that. I remember the teacher who let me read James Baldwin instead of Mark Twain. Huckleberry Finn. I remember my teacher in the, the second grade who thought that my Gullah culture was so fascinating. And when I told her what some of the foods were that we ate, she made it feel like it was cool. She taught me some, she was an indigenous woman, taught me some of the words and things from her language, and it was amazing. I remember the art teachers who let me just kind of do my thing and figure it out through trial and error and find my vision. The ones who at some point in time understood the type of kid that they were dealing with and knew that the convention wasn't going to work. That there was something else there and helped me develop it. Was that most of the experience that I had? No. Absolutely not. But those are the ones that I remember the most. Those are the ones that you have every opportunity to be and inspire. It's you. Correctness is what we say it is. We can throw it out all together. But there's a butterfly effect to the thing that you think, the thing that you believe, the thing that you say. It's the thing that takes a child from a dirt road in Mount Holly, South Carolina, to debating those ideas that he's carried with him his whole life on the podium, at the podium in Yale Political Union. I, I can't explain to you the odyssey between those two points. When you're at Harvard and working with Princeton on the language, that you have been pouring yourself into and working with and collaborating with Yale, having students go to Oxford and taking the things that they taught with you, all these schools, and you couldn't get a word in edgewise in a small town, South Carolina classroom. If there's any value that anything I just said in my personal value, personal bio can do anyone, it's not for me. I just want you to know whatever you think of me now. If you think I'm smart now, if you think I'm intelligent now, if you think that Harvard made me think again, as W.B. Du Bois said, I can assure you, <laughs> the, honor, the honor was theirs. If you, whatever thing you think of me, I don't 
want you to see me as I am right now. I want you to imagine if you can the kid that I was then. A little big head, brown skin, eyes, peasy head, with those dimples, ready to learn, ready to talk, teach, engage. Let them. The best teachers remain great students. And sometimes we're students of our students. So I, I, I want you to just take a second before we end this particular part, and I'll take questions, but I, I honest to God want you to do this. Try for a second to place yourself back in your classroom. Not as the teacher, as the student. Find the most vulnerable space where you were, where someone could have been the one that lended you a hand and you lend that kid a hand. You reach inside and lend that kid a hand. And that's what I do. That's what I try to do every day. Every day that I get up and do this, every day. I remember the crying. I remember the isolation. I remember the kid who would rather sit up in a tree and talk to himself, make up characters. The kid who had the tape recorder that he'd put his head in the washing machine for reverb and create radio shows that learn to rap and beatbox and dance and whatever would get people's attention and make them have a good time, who learn to impersonate family members. Brilliant. And just got so jaded after a while. I barely eked out of school. Only to excel at all the things that I was underestimated at doing. And so I, I encourage you to reach inward to the child that you were and give yourself what you needed by way of your service to other children, to other students, to your colleagues, to have grace for the next person. And above all, have grace for yourself because you can only give what you have. To give. And so that is my contribution to, I don't know if it'll, I, you can call it my legacy or not, but it is, it is the thing that I have to give. My father said to me once in a conversation, our, si our siblings would get tired of him witnessing, oh, daddy called and he gonna preach. Daddy called and he gonna witness. And of course, as a preacher, of course you're gonna do that. But there was one particular time I was in New York and daddy called me. And for some reason this day, he was on it. Book, chapter, and verse, I could hear the, the pages turning. He was on it. And he was in rare form and he was telling me this and that. And he would ask me a question and then cut me off before I could answer because he already knew. And he, we, we had that thing. And I remember saying to myself, don't resist. Like, don't, don't debate, let him, I even gave him some amens and that's right, daddy. And then at the end of it all, daddy said, it got real quiet. And he said, that's it, son. That's all I got. That's what I have to give. It made sense. He, he wasn't preaching. He was loving me. And this is the most valuable thing that he, this is what I got. This someone who's, who's been abandoned as a kid, his, his, his father wasn't there for him. He had to figure it all out. Didn't have a lot of money. Didn't have material things. He didn't have an estate that he could leave behind. Like this is what I got. And I'm giving it all to you. And I 
never screened a call ever again. And it ended up being the best decision I ever made because the best conversation my father and I ever had ever in the, the, the entirety of both of our lives was a call that I didn't screen. And that was because I listened and I received what he had to give. So I would leave you with the question, what do you have to give? That's what I got. That's all. Biatch. Any questions? Definitely. I feel like before we take questions, I just wanted to sit with this for a second and you know send our love to everything that you just said. Son, we appreciate you so much for being here. And I think everybody, if you want to clap or just put some emojis, right? Emojis are language. Uh, please do so right now. And then, yeah, we're happy to take chat or questions. Uh, Karen and I, you can put a question in the chat if you don't want to unmute or if you'd like to ask to unmute. We're happy to have your voice here chatting with Son. Um, yeah. I'm just looking at the chat. Oh, okay. All the emojis. I love it. The chat the is chat. Fire. 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 Yeah, I'm keeping an eye on the chat so I can read any questions. And also, son, as someone who was sitting in a hub room until a second ago, um, I just hope you could. I know it can be hard to um, to uh, feel the the um, the you know do the um, Zoom thing, make the you know lecture on Zoom. But the the love in the chat and in the room was really incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and no, I I um have a habit if there are so many faces like I don't know who to look like you can't tell I'm making eye contact so my face is looking like so I'm actually just like looking straight ahead and couldn't see anyone but I'm I'm glad to know that I also want to give a shout out to the to the the sign interpreter I don't know if you you I've mentioned this before but this is like one of my most like highest aspirations is to get really good at signing I'm not gonna butcher anything right now but i do a little something something every now and then but that's my goal and um it's just such an amazing thing to be able to communicate um that way that i aspire to 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 be fluent and so i i'm grateful glad that you're here and it's just awesome yeah i was thinking the same thing son i was also i already love the expression such an expressive way to communicate um, but it looks like we do got a question um, from tanya so tanya i'm going to go ahead and um, ask to unmute you so you can share your question and have a conversation with son thank you so much my name is tanya blackwell and i literally just found this um conference like three minutes before it started <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole long story about how that came to pass, and um, I don't, I, I may be a little, I might be a little opportunistic right now, but I would really love to know how I can connect with you to bring you on for a webinar for our professional um, organization. No, that's, I welcome the opportunism because that's what we are here for, um, and so Everything is at Sun Michelle on, on social media, Twitter, Instagram. Everything I sent you a message Michaud. on Instagram, but I was like, I don't know. It's all these people. So uh, good call because my DM. I am. <laughs> so, so sun at sunmichelle.com also works, but yeah, my good call on the DM. But about if I um, see it, I'll make sure that we connect. But sun at sunmichelle um, also works as well. And I'm glad you glad you made it. 
Thank you so much. This was really timely for me. And it's interesting because I realized I sort of had a, the reverse experience. I grew up in California and I moved to Georgia when I was 16. And so it was an interesting dynamic of being in classes with white people, but then also having my black peers tell me that I talk like a white girl. And I'm like, well, I don't know, this is, you know, so it's, it's a very interesting introspection hearing you speak and thinking about my experiences with language and even being that person who would police other people's grammar and things of that nature. So right. this is very eye-opening for me. So thank you so much. You know, I was um, actually going to do a video about um, the talk like a white girl thing. There was, there was a sister who had a video and um, her thing was, um, she was like, you know, I really get tired. Like people saying that I talk like a white girl. Like, I mean, <laughs> oh my God. You know, like no, they, you know what I'm saying? Like all black people talk like talk alike. Like, you know, what do you mean? And I'm like, I'm like, girl, <laughs> come on, like, you know, like cha, like I know all white guys don't talk like this, but like, dude, you know, like, come on, if I you if you're from Cali or the Valley, then yeah, you're gonna have the regional thing happening there. But what happens, I think, a lot of times is that people going back to what I said before, people don't understand how loaded language really is and that we're dealing with correlations more so than like causation, we're dealing with correlations. People will say you, and, and, and I mean black people, black people will say on one hand, you can't talk white because the thing that we're talking about is intelligence, status, prestige, so we don't want white people to be associated with that thing exclusively because we want in. And then the same black people to turn around and say, oh, that one, they talk ghetto. <laughs> right. Oh, word. So now you do believe that a manner of speech can be correlated to a, a culture or associated with a group of people. Like, so now you do believe in that. So, so you just want to make sure that you get in on the good stuff and then relegate those folk over mm. there to the bad one. When you accuse a white person of using a black scent, it's mm. right there in the name. Black scent, a black accent. So how then can the concept of a black scent exist if you can't talk white? We know good and well what we're doing. And people will say, well, I'm only talking the way that they taught me to talk in school. So if speaking intelligently is speaking white, then okay, then color me white. Listen, whose school, whose language, who created that system? Who created academia? Who was the one? Are you telling me that indigenous people created the educational mm -hmm. system? Did, did, Formerly enslaved Black people create the educational system? Was it the Asian Americans who had laws in, uh, uh, set against them and put in concentration camps during certain? Who was it? Was, was it? was it? Was it the even the Italians who at one point in time would even consider legally white? Who did it? You keep saying academic, you keep saying academia, and you keep saying school in education, but whose education? Everyone in this room right now knows public education didn't always exist. We all know that, right? But at the, as we know it now, this concept of school, as we know it, an educational the department of education didn't always exist. Now that's not to say that schools didn't always exist. That's not to say that, that people didn't always teach each other stuff. In school, in, in school, schools, but the current umbrella of like the educational system that we have didn't always exist as is. We didn't always have social security numbers. Like there are a lot of things that came into existence that didn't always exist. So how? Who structured it? Where did the language come from? Whose language? If we're using st so-called standard English, are you telling me that black people created English? and then forced everyone to speak it so let's be for real 
let's please be so for real. When we're talking about this, that is not to say that talk white is really actually literally a thing, but we've accepted that this is black. Despite that there's no scientific basis to that. Okay, that's, that's just not true. There's no, we're talking about hereditary traits that we've assigned certain social markers to say, well, well this means this and this means that. There are people who think that Mexican is a race. Well, what if I was born in Mexico? Hmm. You, you see what I'm saying? Like we, we play fast and loose with the rules when it's convenient, but then when it comes to something that's disfavorable, then we separate ourselves from it. What they're often talking about it when you're being told that you sound white, and this I think hopefully will be useful to black people who are told this, okay? You've never heard anybody say, Malcolm X sound like a white guy. They just don't do that. Malcolm X is very articulate. Don't sound like a white dude, okay? Martin Luther King is one of the greatest orators of all time. There's nobody walking around saying, I could, if you close your eyes, it's like you're talking to, he's listening to a white guy. Nobody says that. So how is it all these, you know, uh, these, these people who are just top tier, I mean, top tier spokes people, the top tier orators are not said that. Maya Angelou, who thinks Maya Angelou sounds like a white woman? <laughs> You can't get much more articulate and eloquently so than Maya Angelou. They're responding to the tone in your voice. There's two things that are happening in the tone in your voice. And then if you brought that Cali up speak with you, at the end of your words, when you say it like that, that question intonation, that rising intonation at the end, that, that's a regional thing. And it's not something that Black people typically utilize in our language because we have like a down intonation. Mm -hmm. So instead of asking you, hey, do you want something to drink? I would turn to you and say, you want something to drink? Mm. You don't want anything to drink. <laughs> and it sounds like I'm talking, I'm telling you, you don't want anything to drink. I'm like, hey, you don't want nothing to drink. And you know, because we're using down intonation, that what I'm actually asking you is, do you want a drink? But most of the people associate questions with rising intonation, and that's that valley sort of thing that they're that they're responding to. So it's it and, and the only and the thing that they associate that most with is white people. No, it's not relegated to white people, and no, it's not a racial marker identifier or whatever. But is the correlation that's made socially because most of the people who utilize that intonation are white, and you can pretty much go to Australia and, and go crazy with it. Like it, it, you'll find it everywhere in Australia. So that's, that's, that's one of the things that they're responding to. So no, you're, you're, you're not, you're not Caucasian. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> you're welcome. So we have a lot of questions in the chat too. And um, I know a few people have their hands raised too, but I wanted to get some of the chat questions and I sort of um, collapsed some of them into, um, into groupings. Um, one of the, I'm trying to pick which one to do first because there are so many great questions, but there were several questions about how do we give feedback as writing teachers, given this, like what are some productive ways to give feedback that's not, you know, I know, I knew you'd want to answer it. So, um, you know, that's not using these kind of normative, you know, oppressive models. Great. Um, I, I, I love this question because, um, in part because it's so often posed as a gotcha. I know not in this instance, but it's so often posed as a gotcha because people are so under the impression that you have to do it, that sort of this or that, like that, you know, you can give it this or you can give it that. Like, they, like you have, it has to be this dichotomy of this is right, this is wrong. And that, but that doesn't really make sense. Like a lot of people aren't aware. Some people ask like, whatever happened to Ebonics? Like, why do we say um, AAVE or AAE as it were? Um, or Black English, what happened to the Ebonics? Well, what happened to Ebonics, and I'm sure most of you know the story, but for those of you who don't, um, what happened to Ebonics, um, in, in, in part, first and foremost, um, the concept of us utilizing it in schools was in originally intended to take what the students already knew and use that as a basis or reference 
to teach them new things. So instead of swapping out the old with the new, there would be a, a sort of bridge. Um, so if it's a question of we're trying to figure out uh, continuous forms, if we're doing verb tense, um, present progressive or you know continuous forms, and, and I say, who be eating cookies? Okay, in that instance, what do you really want? If it's right there, like <laughs> there it is, you can use that to say, hey, did you know that the verb tense of who be eating cookies is, or it, I'm, then I'm gonna remember that because it's based on a thing I already know. Now you can either do that or teach them a whole new sentence that they do not speak that way. And now I got to remember the rules and the sentence at the same time. And it sounds funny because, you know, as Tanya pointed out, now you got me talking white. <laughs> and, and so it, but start with the objective first. If your objective is to teach them the rule, teach them the thing that the, the, the technique to teach them the thing that they don't know, the grammar rule. Um, in my own teachings, I start with that. Like say, for example, in Gullah, as commonly you know, is the case, uh, there, there's some variations. If I said, okay, we're gonna talk about verb tense today. And the verb tense is going to be your past, present, future, or present progressive, continuous form, a thing that happens as opposed to a thing that happened. And the way that we are going to do that is by modifying our verbs because our verbs stay in their base form, their base infinitive form, they don't change. Um, and this is again, traditional old school um, gala as opposed to the modern contemporary variation in the form of Geechee. So if you're talking about like traditional old school gala, the verb tenses don't change. So if say is the verb in the sentence, say, and the past tense of say would be said, the present tense of say would be saying, and then of course you will need will say, going to say something to modify it for, for a future, um, or continues to be like says. In Gullah, we're doing that differently. Now, this is where the answer to the question comes in. Gullah student kicks in and they want to know about verb tenses. Now, you can either do every, say everything I just said, where they're going to remember said, says, saying, will say, or you can say, hey, you know, when you say, ad say, that's your past tense. Okay, so if it's as say is your past tense. Does say is your continuous. Us say is your present. Gus say is your future. Now the verb didn't change in any of that. It's just ad, da, a, uh, and ga for the tense to be established. Once you say that to a student for whom that's their reference, I remember that rule for two reasons. Number one, I remember that rule because it was relative to information I already have. So you don't have to teach the whole, the whole shebang because I already know a part of it and you use the piece of what I already know as reference. But here's the other part that we sometimes forget as educators is that these students didn't pop up out of thin air in the desks in your classroom. They go out into the world, they go out into a society that perceives them a certain way. Now, what if you're a child, a student, even if you're not a child, a student who didn't know that? You, you grew up around people all the time. And in fact, every time I say that, people are like, yeah. When he has said that, oh, that's, you're right. You now know a piece of yourself. You know about a piece of yourself. You now have a way to prove you're not inferior. You now have a grammar rule to prove that your language is legit. You've given them something to be proud about 
a way of defending themselves, a way of, of, of showing that there's some sophistication to the way that they speak. You've given them a thing of value that relates back to themselves. And the more you do that, they will be the ones who will be the John the Baptist for you. They, they will be the ones preaching the praises, the, uh, the, uh, the praises of your classroom because you're giving them something that is useful. How many times have you heard a student say, when am I ever gonna use that? Well, when you live in a society where you're dealing frequently with biases and discriminations and things against you, you're gonna use it frequently. And so that's the value is instead of saying, we're gonna swap one for the other, what you do is you just never reject it. Ne I never reject it. When they come in class saying, oh, that's the lady, bro. Like, you know, that never reject it. it. You know, on God, you never, never any of it. I saw a teacher who had the, 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 the rules of words that were banned in her classroom. You don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. Accept it as is now, let me be clear. I know that profanity and slurs and things like that, that's a different, I'm not talking about that, I'm, but I'm, I'm saying in regards to their day-to-day -day speech, embrace it and use it to your advantage. And I would say that even when you're speaking about formal writing, like formal papers, I think you give them assignments where they're allowed to write formal papers in informal language. That doesn't have to be the only version of it. You can let them do two different versions you know, of it, but get them used to the idea of being able to use their everyday way of speech in long form writing and writings that are dealing with complex issues so that they will find a place for your lessons in their everyday life. Does that make sense? I think never rejected is going to be your your next t-shirt based on the yeah. based on the response in the chat is that is I think that's landing <laughs> like the people. <laughs> um Heather, do you want to I know somebody um has their hand up or we can do another question from the chat. Yeah, I think we should go to Ashani first and then next in the chat. Thanks, Karen. Hi, I'm Ashani. Um, I am a PhD student in linguistic anthropology. So shout out to my professor, Dr. April Bickerbell, for putting me on to this event. Hey. Um, I love her so much, and I just wanted to honor her name in this space. Um, and excuse me, because I'm kind of geek and I'm a big fan. So if I'm asking a question that's kind of like all over the place, I also came in a bit late. Um, but I am currently transitioning between coursework and then starting my field work and I will be working with Gullah and um, African American English and so one of the things that I'm constantly trying to like poke and prod uh, people who are doing language scholarship um, in and about is like how you would advise someone who's trying to navigate these spaces of doing language work who's both kind of placed in the academy but also wanting to develop more community workshops um, and more community oriented um, just spaces of education and, and how we can really kind of harness the resources that like I have like proximity to as someone who's in this massive institution um, and really get more towards talking about pedagogies that are happening outside of the classroom because that's really what I'm more passionate about. And um, I work in language and healing. And so I'm really more concerned with people who are not going to be in these academic spaces and who feel very uncomfortable in these spaces. Right. Um, I think that one of the most, I, mean, I, I can't preach the praises enough of social media. Um, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt in my mind, social media has been the great equalizer in a lot of ways. Um, early on, I think people, well, let me just be clear. Don't play the social media game of trying to create content for likes and clicks and, you know, don't, don't do that part. Like that, that's not, that's not the thing. So if you have a, 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 a profile that has, I don't know, 1200 followers and you average maybe 
20 likes. And if you get 50 likes, it's like, oh, hey, 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 I got 50 likes today. You know, celebrate them 50 likes. Celebrate them 50 likes. Get, get a couple clicks and shares. You don't know what you put out that's going to be the spark for someone else. And you, don't, you, you never know when, when something's going to go viral, when something's going to not go viral, but someone saw it who was moved by it. Um, one of the projects that I did that had a big boost in my professional career is one that no one saw because it was on my phone and the drive, the hard drive that it was on died and crashed. And so the only thing in existence of it was this clip on my phone. And I showed it to someone who was in a position to, to look out for me. Now, I didn't know that at the time. We were just striking up conversation. And I'd say, yeah, you know, it's working on this film and yada, yada, yada. And I'd say, well, let me see it. And I put it, showed it to him. They turned out to be a director. And so I'm walking around with this thing in my pocket you know, for a while thinking, oh man, it's all, all is lost and nobody saw it, but it ended up helping to be part of the reason we're having this conversation now. So if it's an old post, um, hardly anybody, see, keep plugging away. Now I'm going to, I'm going to let you in on something. Okay. <laughs> this is, this is getting into the lore getting into the, into the, you know, well, I guess everybody's in on it. So I now am on all, well, most of the platforms. Um, I don't even know why I have a Snapchat. I think I just got it so that nobody else would get it first <laughs> in my name. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, you know, about the LinkedIn crowd, I'm not really, you know, I'm, 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 I'm doing a little something, something. but I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, but you know, TikTok, uh, Instagram, of course, Facebook, you know, because you know, I don't, you know, I'm not gonna say anything shady about Facebook, but, um, Facebook and, um, YouTube. Okay. Here's the thing as it pertains to social media now, and I hope this is motivational. <laughs> so kept being told, get on TikTok, get on TikTok, get on TikTok. I'm like, but I'm not doing any dances on TikTok. I'm not doing all of that. Like, you know, it, no, 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 no. Trust me, you got to try it. You got to get on TikTok. Now, and these are still up. If you go back in my early, early, early TikTok days, you'll see content of me talking, is my morning meditation, me talking about the things that have inspired me today. And just, you know, very sort of, uh, and I'm still this way, by the way. I'm, I'm still very, very cosmic and all that. I'm, it's just one of my least noticeable traits these days, I guess. But I'm, I'm still very philosophical. And, you know, and if you're in the trap, then are you stuck or are you trapped? Sort of, sort of thing. And then giving my ideas about certain things. And then I'll do like a little sketch here and there for the language. And over the course of time, my videos start picking up traction. And then it just shot off. Like it was just off to the races and I started getting more and more um, attention. And then I started getting attention from racists and bigots and just, you know, boo boo to fools who would start reporting my content. Now I didn't really know the, the TikTok rules of the streets, you know, that people could actually do that. Like, you know, I thought you had to actually do something to get your stuff, you know, banned. Nope. Not on TikTok. TikTok started banning me left to right. Every time I got a new um, landmark, 50,000 followers, 100,000 followers, 150, I was getting 10,000 followers a day at one point. And each time I broke through another landmark, banned 30 days, threatened to lose my account. So I said, you know what? I better back these videos up on YouTube. So one day I started downloading all of my TikTok videos and putting them on YouTube and forgetting about it. I only had like a few thousand um, followers on um, YouTube and that's over the course of years. It had been many years because I, you know, I didn't really deal with YouTube a lot, but you know, I would some, from time to time put videos there. So I started 
saving all of my TikTok videos on YouTube. It just never looked back. One day, I started getting notifications, like racking up notifications on my phone. I'm like, what is going on with my phone? And so I, I looked because I had another video go viral on TikTok. But by that time, TikTok had started throttling my, my reach after that point. And so I just weirdly stopped being able to like really get traction over there. But this other app was like blowing up my phone. It was YouTube. Like, but YouTube, let me go over there and check and see what's going on. Remember all those videos that I had uploaded from TikTok to YouTube? Well, little did I know, YouTube had created YouTube Shorts, their competitor for TikTok. The thing that they were going to use to compete with TikTok. And YouTube was aggressively pushing shorts, but nobody was making shorts. I was, because I was taking my TikTok videos and putting them on YouTube. So little did I know, I was supplying a steady stream of content that was exactly the product that YouTube wanted and they were pushing it. And I had amassed for multiple videos, 100,000 views, 10,000 to 20,000 views. My following had ballooned up to 60,000 people. And like 60,000, how did I get 60,000 people? One particular video had a million views. Couldn't imagine it. Then it was 2 million. And then it was 3 million. And then four. By the end of the following day, it was 7 million. And by the end of a few days later, it was 10 million. And then it ended up right now at 15 million and counting. Just one video. The other videos had two and a half million, two million, another million. My content had created its own little universe on YouTube without me. I just uploaded the content and it did its own thing without me even knowing. And then came a check <laughs> from YouTube. What? And so the, the whole, I just set out to back up my TikToks. That's all I did. I just set out to make sure that I didn't lose those videos that TikTok banned me. And it turned out to be serendipitous that I did that. And then I said, well, you know what? What will happen if I consciously, intentional, really take this social media creator thing seriously and study the trends and be yourself? I knew I wasn't going to start doing all kind of foolishness. I wanted to make sure that whatever it was I did, because you never know what it is that you're going to blow up for. So make sure that it's something that you want to do. It's kind of like Chubby Checker's got to love the song, The Twist, because you're going to be singing The Twist for the rest of your life, right? And so make sure you're doing the thing that you want to do. And in this case, I did that. And now I'm at 225,000 followers on YouTube. I think 335 or some 37, I can't remember, on, on TikTok, 170 on Instagram, 1000, um, 170K on Instagram. I forgot how many I was on, on, on threads and, um, and, uh, well, X, Twitter, Twitter X, I don't know. I still call it Twitter. Um, but I said all that to say that it's collectively about a million followers, but what happened was organic. So you today could be putting out content that may not at first do anything. But if you put it across the platforms, you never know which app is going to catch fire, how many people use which particular one and how they're going to use it in their day-to-day -day life. And, um, you know, we could talk about, you know, some other time about, you know, how to package it, how to promote it and make sure that, you know, the time limits and, and the introduction and the right, the arc of a thing. I mean, there's a lot of heady stuff that works, but because of that, very many of the people that I meet now professional, know me from social media. They, that's how we met. That's how, that's how they saw it, saw me. And many of the opportunities that I've had came from someone in some instances, 
who had been watching me for years. They, they sat back and enjoyed the content where we're like, but mm, maybe he'll say something wild one day. Like they, someone told me that they were, they were waiting for me to say something like sexist or ableist or like, you know, when's it gonna, surely the shoe's gonna drop eventually. And two and a half years went by discussing really complex issues and the consistency finally made them say, hey, would you like to be the speaker at this event? Or someone, hey, we would like to publish a book with you. Like the thing that, that the, the, the consistency was there. So it's not only the content for the people that you're providing, but your social media in a sense serves as like your CV. It serves as a way for people to check you out and see what you're about um, and what kind, of, what kind of person you are and whether or not you can, you can be trusted. And the best thing that you can do is create content that the community that you're trying to serve can make their own. If they can do that, um, they will be the ones that give you wings. At, it's the reason that my motto is a common phrase um, that we will use, you know, which is we outcha as opposed to I outcha. <laughs> so, so it's, it's a collective thing and, and recognizing that the greatness um, from within comes from the collective. So I would encourage you to, to, yes, focus on academia and all the things that come along with it. But if you want to do that, that, uh, that, that Prometheus thing where you bring fire down from, from, the, from the mount of the gods to, 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 to mankind, um, I think social media will help you do that. Sorry about the long-winded ex explanation, but I just kind of hope that you got something out of that transition of how I got to where I am now on social media. No, I think that was super helpful, uh, Ben. And also, I just want to shout out to uh, Dr. Baker Bell because Ms. Shani brought her up, right? She was our one of our keynotes last year. Amazing person, amazing speaker. Uh, check out her work, too. Um, and I also want to note, right, Ashani mentioned this, like, interest in healing and, right, linguistic justice. And I feel like Sun covered that so much today. That was blowing up in the chat right now with everyone's talking about this being therapy for us. And it's a real thing. And I think that that healing is so important for us and for our students. And then I think, Karen, yeah, you want to ask one more question from the chat? I think we've got time. Yeah, we have so many amazing questions. And I think some of them I just want to give shout outs to without asking them because I want to ask a different one that um, just um, because I feel like we had great questions about teaching youth and teaching ESL. And I feel like some of your previous responses might have mm -hmm. also given some ideas about that, even though I would I think we'd all love to hear all the things you'd have to say about it. And I know you've, you've taught youth. And, um, you know, specifically, but there was a question that was in a different direction about uh, how do we approach an administration when we're teaching, mm -hmm. you know, within a system that is not supportive of this. And I thought right. that might be something you haven't addressed yet that could be helpful to people. I always tell people um, when they ask, you know, how, you know, how do you do this at Harvard? Like, basically, Harvard is the evil empire. Like, what do you do in there? <laughs> Should, shouldn't you be somewhere else um and i'm like look i get it you're not wrong um but the institution is more than brick and mortar they're people it's made up of people so when someone on the outside looking in thinks harvard they're thinking harvard i'm thinking like john you know i'm thinking Francis, like the, these, Harvard has a name and a face, it's, it's Joan, it's, you know, the people I know um, that I can talk to, that, that I can link up with and network with. Um, and it's, it's for example, um, for Professor Don, Daniel Donahue, um, who's in Harvard's um, language, uh, English department. Um, I've lectured in English department a few times. And upon his invitation, he saw one of my videos where I was talking about um, white academics who touch on issues, topic subjects that are relative to black studies or black people, but you don't invite black people or black academics or, you know, to the table to speak for themselves. Like you just kind of speak over us and maybe sometimes use us as a reference but for the most part, you get the limelight and um, we just kind of get in where we fit in. 
and um, he he saw that um, that video and, and and agreed. He was like, you know, yeah, actually, I think that's that's a, a, a great perspective. Would you like to lecture at you know um, in, in the department? I'm like, in and of itself, that's a distinction that that would be you know awesome. Um, but the fact that it came from such an organic space from a person who knows and understands how academia works, the rank and file works and what it takes to, you know, to, to, to get an invitation to be able to say, you know what? Yeah, you're right. I'm going to buck the convention and invite you to come through and, and it was a beautiful thing. We got invited again, invited again. And I think that that's where you start with. You're at the institution, but who's in what position that you can talk to? You know, I hate to say it's like the 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 the, the reality show Survivor <laughs> or some sort of game show. You can't vote a bad administrator off the island um, you know, like that. But you you can try to build network relationships. Um, you know. Is, is as best as possible. Now I full disclosure, I don't have a work spouse. I I don't I don't I don't have uh you know a lot of the 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 personal sort of tie-ins um that people have in my department at the at the overall institution, yes. But in the department, um it's not a thing that I force. Um and so as we go on about our business, um we all kind of do our things separately, but um, outside of the department, I've made a lot of really like wonderful, um, you know, connections and friends that have been advantageous professionally. So when you're dealing with administrators, you're dealing with, a, it's a question of power. So pa there's a, that old phrase, like absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know, sometimes people see suggestions and alternative ideas or whatever as a threat to their position or as disrespect to their authority. Um, they consider conventional wisdom and doing it the way it's supposed to be done um, to be a mark of proficiency, that, that everybody's doing the same thing exactly as dictated is a mark of proficiency. And that's what matters. Whereas someone else may look at it and say, well, how will we ever move forward and how will we ever create new things if newness and, and have bolder ideas if we're all just being proficient and, and doing, at doing the same thing? So I, I want to say this in two parts and, and not give false hope. One part of it, you, can't, you can do something about. The other part, you can't do anything about. What you can do something about is learning the language of the people around you that makes them feel heard and respected and vice versa. Like finding the way that you can communicate to one another in a way that doesn't feel subversive, but more inclusive. And so if a thing isn't working, maybe don't lead with, this isn't working. We need to do something different. Um, maybe lead with something more along the lines of, um, you know, I've been thinking maybe we could try exploring some other things that may work as well. Have you considered this language, you know, that type of inclusive language. I think you utilize similar techniques that you would with, with students because we're all people at the end of the day. So you try to be more inclusive and respectful of their journey and where it took, how they got there. So networking is on a job, uh, on the job is an important thing. But I will say this, there are some people who are simply deeply entrenched in their position of authority and power. And you can't make them not themselves. You, you can't, the system is broken in a lot of ways for a reason. And we've seen this happen time and time again, where the difference one person makes to an institution can be night and day. Like 
from the top down, like firing the right person and replacing them completely changed the complexion of, no pun intended, the complexion of an institution because the leadership had installed an atmosphere of fear and competition amongst the educators where you're, you know, you're now testing to see for the, for the results, like the, the, the standardized tests and how were they doing? And we're looking for the numbers, the stats. That's what you're teaching for. I want the numbers, I want the stats, I want the proficiency. These students, that's what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm, we're at a, at, a, at, a, at a bottle, we're putting bottle caps on bottles in a factory. We're cranking out, you know, bratwurst. You know, like that's what we're doing at this point. We're not really educating students. We're preserving our position as educators, but you are powerful too. And that's the thing that's, that you have to remember is you are powerful too. And I think that you exercise some degree of reason and some deg degree of measure and um, you know, some degree of appeal to their better angels and showing how something can be both progressive and proficient, since you know they're going to be looking for that. How something can be an idea can be professional, uh, profe uh, you know, progressive and proficient. But if you find yourself in a rut of someone else's just preservation, self preservation, go rogue. Like, <laughs> do. Do it until somebody tells you not to. Like, teach the lesson anyway. Be subversive. Give, in those four walls, that, that's your time to teach those students what you want to. As long as they know what they're supposed to know, at the end of the semester, you can also teach them the other things your way. And go rogue. I tell people all the time, I've been trying to get fired since I got hired. And so far, no luck. Oh, no, it's not so, they're going to keep you. They're not going to let you go. Um, <laughs> I just want to say that's like such the perfect thing to leave us with. Um, I, I'm going to take that personally on, by the way, go rogue if whoever is hearing me from GCC. Um, but uh, before I pass off to Michelle to close us out and thanks on, I also wanted to thank uh, speaking of colleges, <laughs> thank the Glendale College Foundation because they helped us get some here. Um, we would not be able to do it without that uh, financial support. Also, really quick shout out because uh, you noted that oh, that beautiful line that people threw up in the chat. Uh, dictionaries are descriptive, not prescriptive. I just picked up this dictionary called the Queen's English, um, and I love its play on right the King's English, right? It's for the LGBTQIA plus community. And one of the things it says in the front is, in, it's about history, identity, and pride. And so it is about providing exactly what you were talking about with dictionaries being descriptive. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Michelle. Thanks everybody. And Sun, thank you so much. I've been going rogue for years and now here I am helping to organize this conference and we have you here going rogue with us. We cannot be more more honored to have you with us this morning and this was such a beautiful talk i was sorry i didn't have the tissues in the room i think a lot of us needed it at times we were fired up we were tearing up you hit all you hit us in all the fills thank you so much for being mm -hmm. our keynote speaker on this third year of our conference and I we look forward to all your work coming soon I appreciate your invitation. And uh, to complete that um, for Heather, the uh, phrase dictionaries don't create words for people, people create words for dictionaries. And if that's the one, if there's one thing that you could remember, I would want you to remember that part, that we are the ones creating the words for the dictionaries, not vice versa. Love it, thank you, Ben, appreciate you. Awesome. Well, beautiful people, I will see you on social media. Feel free to give me a call or um, if you have any other questions or want to send me any questions, you can do that and, and I'll try to get to some maybe on social media, but, um, or you can just meet me there. Awesome. Excellent. So we have a break coming up, right? Who's, who's taking us to the break? You are on some music. I am. 
All right, we're gonna go out with some music. It says 11 to 11.15, a little shorter, but uh, yeah.